Blueline Expo international attendees. I'm Brianna Charlebois, editor of Blue Line Magazine. We are joined by Special Agent Sherry Oz. She is in charge of the Drug Enforcement Administration's Phoenix Field Division. We will be chatting about drug trafficking and the ongoing fentanyl crisis, which is actively growing and impacting both Canada and the United States. Thanks for joining us for our session. Thank you, ma'am. Happy to be here. So maybe just to start, maybe give us a little bit of a background, how um, your career sort of, sort of led you to the DEA in Phoenix. So I started my law enforcement career in the 90s here in Phoenix. I grew up in Chicago. It was very cold there. So it was purely weather-driven decision to, um, to become a police officer here in Phoenix. So I uh, became a detective. I got really interested in investigations and um, kind of the hunt going after really bad guys and uh, found myself applying for DEA and uh, sent to Los Angeles. I spent almost 10 years in LA as a, a special agent and then I promoted, went to Miami and then um, did a headquarters rotation, promoted again and was the chief of special agent recruitment and hiring. And then I uh, went to Seattle as an assistant special agent in charge uh, for about a year and then promoted again to the special agent in charge of the Phoenix Field Division. And currently I run um, or I lead uh, the agents, diversion investigators, chemists, intel analysts, and administrative staff uh, in the state of Arizona. Um, we did have an initial conversation and we sort of talked about um, how drug trafficking is impacting Arizona specifically. So I don't know if you wanna maybe um, expand on that, uh, maybe talk about what the biggest issues impacting law enforcement as it relates to um, the opioid crisis, specifically fentanyl. So um, just based on geography, the southwest border of the United States brings in uh, or allows through 90% of the illicit drugs consumed in this country. So if you think about Arizona being, you know, 300 miles of, of that piece, we are uh, overwhelmed with drug trafficking because we are the, the pathway into the rest of the, the U.S. And, and into Canada. It, it's got to come through here first. Um, cartels are our primary issue they are bringing in like i said 90 percent of the drugs consumed um fentanyl is very cheap to make it is unquantifiable in in years past we've been able to say okay the problem is cocaine and we could fly over a, a cocoa field and say this is how much how much crop there is and this is how much it, that crop will yield with synthetics there's no saying how much they can make. The precursors are purchased from China, from India, and then Mexico makes uh, fentanyl and methamphetamine, any kind of synthetic in a, in a lab, and the yield is unknown. We're taking off just last year, we took over 6 million pills of fentanyl. And to give you context to that opioid piece, five years ago, we seized zero. Fentanyl wasn't a, uh, an issue. It wasn't part of who we are as a nation. Now it has us um, in its grip and it's not letting go. We are seizing, just last week, we seized 400,000 fentanyl pills from a trafficker running th through uh, Arizona. And now I'm just kind of curious because you sort of mentioned before. So when did fentanyl start really becoming an issue and why do you think that there was that shift? Well, if, if you look at our nation and our, and our drug use, right? So we were a, uh, prior to 2016, we were really a nation that was um, a pill-popping nation. We, we, are, we are raised and if we have a problem, we have an issue, we take a pill for it. So we already have this culture that pills are okay. And I worked in Miami as a, a supervisor in 2011, 2012, I started seeing heroin in pills. And the first time we seized heroin and pills, we, I tried to raise the flag like, this is a great idea. Because for cartels, they don't care about you and me. They, they simply care about our money. So they're looking for, they're, they're business people looking for the next big thing. So here we take a pill popping nation and now we put something highly addictive and we had moms and teens and, and all people from all walks of life that were would not necessarily use heroin because it's dirty, but they would use a pill. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had accidental addicts, people who were buying pills that they thought were something else and they were actually becoming addicted to heroin. Mm -hmm. And then with the rise of synthetics and with China and, and the fentanyl 
precursors being so cheap, Mexico capitalized on, hey, we can get people more addicted and we can have them make and we can make more money because it's really all about building a customer base. And if I can get you addicted to my product, I know you're going to return if you don't die. Um, and when, when fentanyl first hit the scene in Miami, we had in, in the first hour, uh, we had 30 overdose deaths in, in one hour. People were going to the Miami police department and sitting in the parking lot to use, to take their pills or to shoot up because they knew they might die. But mm -hmm it was also worth it for them to take that chance. And they knew if they did it at the police department, we would come out and save them. Um, so this, this fentanyl thing uh, is, a, is a culture we created and now it's just grown and grown and it has us really in its grasp and it, it, it is not letting go. So as this is sort of um, taken over society, how has law enforcement sort of had to pivot? What sort of things have, um, has law enforcement had to do to sort of keep up with this um, issue? So the big thing in law enforcement and especially in DEA is that we don't target users. That's, that's not something that's not part of our culture. That's, um, that's not something we've, we've ever done or will ever do. Um, but we do target those people that prey on the users. And so we have upped our, our focus and we continue to reprioritize so that we are going after the most violent and the worst offenders uh, that affect certainly this country, all of North America, really. Um, also, little things like Narcan. Narcan is the, um, the blocker for opioids, right? And so uh, we had never carried that before. Law enforcement did not normally have that available. We had to call for, for a rescue team or fire or, or to come care for an overdosing person. Now, more and more, Narcan is available, especially since fentanyl is so lethal that law enforcement is actually at risk every time we we encounter somebody who has a fentanyl it it's a powder so it gets in the air and you can ingest it on accident and, and overdose just as as easily as you could doing taking fentanyl on purpose um so we've we've shifted in that we we do go towards care more uh and we're ready to save people's lives in addition to our, our enforcement piece which is a big part of, of who we are also, in the last few years, we've realized, DEA especially, we have been really good with enforcement. Our education, our outreach um, has never been as big of a priority. And we are starting to realize that we actually need to be part of that conversation. We live here for, too, and we want to make sure that our community and our country is protected and safe. So we are getting on the um, kind of, you know, with the rest of the country, we're gonna, we want to educate you and we want to help you say no. That sort of being said, um, has there been sort of changes in PPE tactics, sort of procedures? And um, if so, sort of what, what has that sort of been like? In years past, you know, a SWAT team would come in with a flashbang and um, make entry on a house with the safety of the, the officers in mind. Now that we have fentanyl into the equation, that safety has, has changed dramatically. We're not only afraid of people with weapons because that fentanyl is a very deadly and effective weapon. And as soon as we enter a flashbang, as soon as we enter a, an explosive breaching device, we've now created a uh, potentially lethal environment inside that residence or in the area surrounding it because the powder is airborne and, and can be easily um, consume. In addition, right now we're using uh, hand sanitizer all the time because it's COVID. So we are taking our natural defenses off of our skin. Mm -hmm. And so even the, the fentanyl contact is more easily absorbed by your skin, which presents an even more lethal possible environment for, for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So we are more cautious with our approach. Fentanyl is a consideration on every tactical operation that we that we participate in we have more ppe available uh, and not just masks and gloves but the full tyvek suits so that we can make entry and make sure that our law enforcement uh folks are staying safe right so sort of that tolerance piece obviously the people using probably have a, a bigger bigger tolerance gotcha so you also sort of alluded to it so there have been a couple of changes due to covid um you also sort of talked about this um obviously the globalization of um things sort of being um the sort of process sort of being started in china and then it's kind of filtering through the states through mexico um 
so I'm wondering how, you know, COVID and, and um, you know, the borders being closed and, and things of that nature have affected um, potentially the pipeline of these drugs coming, coming into the States. So certainly there has been a dramatic effect. When the border restrictions were put into place, what we used to see was 100 people ac coming across the border, each with 10 pounds each of product. Now we're seeing, because it's a funnel effect, less people are allowed through, but those people are taking bigger risks, right? Because we still have the, the demand here in the United States is still uh, amazingly high. So they're willing to take the chance, but we're getting larger seizures, just less of them because fewer people are, are crossing. Also, we're seeing some really unique, I, I mean, they're very creative in, in the ways that they're getting things over. Um, mm -hmm. We used to see backpackers coming through the desert with 40 pounds of, of marijuana um, mm -hmm. that would just cross the border and hike it in. And when Border Patrol came or when DEA came to scene or, or local law enforcement, they would abandon their backpacks and you know run off into the desert. Now we're seeing those same backpackers with 50 pounds worth of fentanyl, which is a, it, the, the street value on that is astronomical. Um, people are taking big chances because it's such a big money maker to get it in. Also, um, we're seeing some unique things like concealment places where they're, I, I just watched a, a video where they were cutting open a truck and there were pills falling all over as they were cutting open this truck. So we're seeing unique concealment methods, um, unique disguises, very creative ways. We're still finding it. Yeah, I think I watched um, you, uh, you had an interview with a local station in Arizona, I think in Phoenix, um, and you had, uh, that someone had discovered it within a, a ch child stuffed animal. Um, so I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. Are there any other sort of situations that you've come across that were kind of like that, that um, you hadn't seen before? So we have uh, very recently that glowworm. I just, you know, <laughs> those were around when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, that was a horrible thing to have uh, a toy for your child and to, when you go to clean it, inspect it, there's, uh, you know, 5,000 pills inside there that are, are lethal. Mm -hmm. Um We've seen some good ones where they, oh, no, I shouldn't call them good. We've seen some unique ones, especially with liquefying. So they, they take a liquid form of the illicit drugs and they put them inside of a child's ball, like um, those little balls that have lights inside of them, bouncy balls. Okay. And the ball works, the lights work, but the inside is not uh, liquid. Well, it is liquid, but it's liquid methamphetamine or it has a fentanyl component in the liquid. They're always looking for new ways. Right, right. Is that really hard to um, to detect? Or are you guys sort of catching that as it's sort of coming across the border? It's hard to quantify, uh, certainly numbers like that. We, we have a good idea that we're getting a large quantity right now. We work very closely with our state and local partners. We work very closely with Border Patrol and other federal partners to make sure that we're sharing information and we're all looking for um, similar triggers, similar uh, behaviors so that we're able to to have the most impact and the other sort of piece um with the with covid is um it's happened here in canada and i i know it's happened in the states as well where um our overdose numbers have actually skyrocketed during the pandemic and there have been um several sort of uh sort of guesses as to to why that might be and and um some of them think that maybe because the borders are, are closed and things aren't getting in as easily, they're being laced with other things. Do you have any sort of thoughts on that as to, as to why it's sort of become almost more deadly or at least more widespread during the pandemic? Well, certainly there are some cultural factors, right? Social isolation, there are, there are reasons that people look to escape, right? Um, and some of them are very innocent. The problem, the biggest problem I see with fentanyl is that it can be in anything. Because it is a powder and it's easily disguisable, it is, um, we're finding it in, in other illicit drugs. We're finding it in cocaine. We're finding it in pills that look like Adderall, that look like Xanax. Um, so people think they're taking one thing and they're taking something else. We have cases where we have a person who is legitimately prescribed a Xanax prescription. And because of COVID or whatever reasons, either they're taking more or they couldn't get their prescription. So they're buying what they believe is Xanax from a, a, a street vendor. A, a, an illicit person is selling them this, what they think is Xanax. Mm -hmm. And these people, these patients then know my dose is half a pill. So they break that pill in half and they take their half. And now they've become addicted to fentanyl 
or they overdose. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, some of them are very accidental. It's being put in, uh, we just had one in Yuma where a, a guy had a kilo of cocaine and he scraped some off the top and gave it to his friends. It was fentanyl, they all died. It had fentanyl in the cocaine and they all overdosed. It is, um, it sneaks up on you. And my advice obviously would be to say no, <laughs> don't buy anything illegal because you don't actually know what you're getting even um even something that you think is safe that you take all the time it most likely has fentanyl in it and do you have any sort of uh tips for law enforcement who are trying to kind of keep up with um this sort of growing demand and this growing industry safety first obviously you have to keep yourself safe you have to be able to live to fight another day so i i always go to personal protection make sure that there is no pill, there is no powder, there is nothing that is worth your own life. Um, keeping your, your gloves on, masks on, that type of thing will help you. Keeping Narcan available and you know, accessible to you is really important for your, your safety and survival. Stay up on the trends. Uh, when, you're, when you're looking for fentanyl, we have plenty of resources to help you locate things and find things. Um, and it, it's, it's God's work. Stay in it. Stay in the fight. It's not easy. Uh, keep going, but you're saving people. Every time you take a pill, you're saving somebody. One in every four pills of fentanyl is lethal, has a lethal dose. So that's, we're finding 26% of those pills that are, that are bought in the United States are deadly. You're, every time you're seizing something, you're saving lives. The other sort of piece of this that I, I did definitely want to touch on is, um, I don't know whether you can expand a little bit on um, how Arizona compares to other uh, locations in the states. I know we talked about the, you know, act, like the border being right there, um, but um, also there's th there's this violence piece that always kind of goes hand in hand with um, with drug trafficking. So I don't know if you want to maybe expand on on that, maybe pre-COVID and how it sort of changed as well throughout. So um, the cartels are very violent and very deadly, and there's if I say it over and over and over, it will never be enough because there's no way for me to explain to you the, the brutal pieces, especially in Mexico. Last year, 30,000 people were murdered for narco trafficking. 30,000 people were murdered. And those are people who um, you know, had gotten the way or, you know, slighted somebody in some way. It's an astronomical number. Uh, our Arizona, unique to us, we have the Sinaloa cartel uh, owns, I guess, our, our entry points and they receive taxes for, or a, a, a pass fee for everybody who comes through. Um, they run all the, all the drugs through Arizona. Other states on the Southwest border have different cartels that they're affected by. Primarily, Arizona just has uh, Sinaloa, which was one of the oldest and, and most dangerous, most violent. Um, we are seeing every now and then another cartel will try to impede on Sinaloa, but Sinaloa has taken a, a, a really strong hold, which is why there's 30,000 people killed last year. Um, protecting these routes for them is of the utmost importance because it's money. They... Um, they, they own those, they, and it's sad to say, because this is our state, and we're talking about a, another country owning routes through our state. That's a horrible reality. Um, and we're trying our best to c combat that for sure. It's, it affects all the people who live here, and it affects the entire United States, because the, the stuff comes in, and, and in our case, uh, things are coming in already in pill form. Uh, also powder, but it, primarily in pill form and being packed up and distributed throughout the rest of North America. Right. Interesting. Interesting. And um, we sort of alluded to sort of this globalization and, and how that sort of affected it. Um, can you maybe kind of give me just um, maybe a background as to how that sort of changed, I don't know, in the last couple of decades? So Sinaloa has been around for a long time. And, it, and if you were talking about cartels, mm -hmm. if there's been a, sh there's been a shift uh, It and kind of what the U.S. is consuming, what Canada is consuming, because the the business piece for them it's all about money, right? It, greed, it's just greed, mm -hmm. and so they will they will adjust to what our demands are, and so we've seen a shift where we used to be a uh, a nation that consumed 
cocaine, heroin. It was mostly plant-based. Now we're, we're shifting more towards a synthetic um, appetite. And so as that has changed, countries like Colombia, uh, who had really the, the cocoa leaves and, and they, were, they were making and processing the cocaine, um, they were forced to use Mexico just because of geography as the logistics to get into the United States. So now that Mexico has been become both the producer and the transport piece, they have become more and more powerful. And these cartels have risen to power amongst each other um, based entirely on greed and, and our consumption. So um, that sort of being said, where do, you, where do you see this sort of going next? What are the largest issues you think are going to be impacting um, law enforcement in terms of um, the fentanyl crisis and, and the opioid crisis and, uh, and COVID and, and sort of where, where, this, where this is going, where, where people should sort of start to, to consider and, and put their attention? So I think fentanyl is not gonna go away. In fact, I, uh, my prediction is that May 6th, we lose our, our um, we had an emergency scheduling of fentanyl analogs, mm -hmm. and we've already started to see some new analogs coming out of Mexico. We have a, a, a more potent, more dangerous, more deadly analog called parafluoral fentanyl that we just started finding back in December. It's always existed in the world. It just, now they're put, it was never approved for human consumption. And now it's actually being put into um, these pills. It's cheaper and uh, more deadly for sure. Um, so after May 6th, with, with some of these changes, we're fighting hard to keep the analog piece in play and keep those scheduled. but drug traffickers will look for ways around those laws. And so as they develop new synthetics and new analogs, we're gonna see a lot of a lot more overdoses, I would predict, because they're looking for the next more potent piece. Um, and people don't know what they're taking and it's one pill could kill. That's, that's a message we need to keep repeating that your first time could be your last time. It's not worth even the time, it, the, the price is far too great uh, for this nation. So I, I predict we are going to be overloaded more in the next few years. And, and that's why we're trying to get on the education piece. And we're trying to, to be um, more of a force on the prevention side so that we can start educating people. Because the truth is, and it's old and it's cliche, but if you say no and there is no supply, or there is no demand the supply will will subsequently fall off it's we have to start in your own house you have to start with your own community and start making small changes with the things that you can control that's how we win this that's how uh, our end game is the good guys winning absolutely well that is sort of all of my questions for this session is there anything else you want to add or you think police will be interested to know um regarding the issue just want to plug our, our website mm -hmm. dea.gov uh, which gives you tons of resources information there are some intel pieces on there as well then we have a, a teen uh, focused website called just think twice all one word dot gov a campus drug prevention dot gov and get smart about drugs dot gov and those are all designed to help Parents start conversations with their kids, help teens learn about the truth about uh, illicit substances, uh, and also uh, for, for any adults interested in, in learning about what's really happening right now. Perfect. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Brie.